subject of structural inspections and whatever, uh, just a little bit about me personally. I know of the introduction from the website, I think somewhere. Um, yeah, I, after graduating, I worked for Robert McAlpine um, for six years, and that was very informative, I must say. I uh, worked on Torness Power Station on one of the reactors there. And then, as you had to in those days to get chartered, you had to go into the design office as well. I went into a company called RT James, who you might know about. Um, excellent company. And uh, stayed with them through my formative years and got chartered. And one of the first projects I worked on was with Tilcom, um, who later became, well, who Tarmac later uh, merged with Tilcom and then Breed and Lafarge and all that, that stuff followed as well. Uh, so right from day one of being a design engineer, I was working on quarries, and roughly half of my time was working on quarries. Uh, I became director of Newcastle office of WSP uh, for quite a few years, and then decided that uh, I thought it would be more interesting to set my own company up, uh, which was BT Bell, which is 25 years this year. Um, and uh, we got a practice, there's eight of us in there, but we're working on quarries and electrical infrastructure, um, as you can see on the screen here. So this is with uh, Siemens and BAM, not all, um, as well as other projects as well. Um, and this, I just sort of, I'll show you a selection of these first. Uh, these are electricity substations, and you'd say, well, what's the relationship between that and quarrying? Well, major earthworks, major rock movements, drainage, roads, bridges, buildings, uh, very similar actually, which is just as well, because when 2008 came along, all of the quarry operators shut down capital expenditure and, and, and laid off the engineering teams and, and cut right back and our work in quarries disappeared overnight. But fortunately, um, renewable power came along, uh, and we uh, we worked with Siemens for many years, Rolls Royce as it was before that. Uh, but it filled the gap quite nicely, and it still continues to do so. Um, at least fifty to sixty percent of our work is in the power sector. Quote lock booties that go on a bridge. It's all in Scotland, by the way. Um, we're working in Shetland. Uh, to a new project in Orkney and uh, Dune Ray. This is the Shetland job. So fairly big, big projects, really. But in the meantime, we'll still continue to work in quarrying, of course, um, mostly with Tarmac. But I have worked with uh, all of the companies, I believe all of the companies, um, maybe some smaller, minor ones that I'm not aware of, but uh, worked with Hanson, Breeden, um, RMC, um, Tarmac, Lafarge, Hope, uh, and designed many of the sites. This is Norboard uh, in Inverness, also based in Stirling, and we design uh, structures for uh, Norboard, so that they've now changed their name to West Fraser, and they're based in Stirling, where they make Stirling Board. Apparently it's not where the name comes from, but uh, it's called Sterling Board. This is a 120 million pound um, facility in Inverness. Um, so I'll just let a few of these cycle through. You can see, I mean, we don't do all of the plant, but um, we do all the civils and the buildings. And there's some pretty big buildings, as you can see on this site. Now, I'm happy for people to put their hand up and ask questions as we go, um, or you can keep them to the end. It's, 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 a, it's up to you. So this is going to last about 45 minutes altogether. Um, so there you go. Right, Ian, uh, I'm ready to move on to the... Oh, we won Robert Stevenson Award for that, by the way. <laughs> Fifth pass in Hexham. Oh, we're based in Hexham. But at the minute, nearly all of our work's in uh, Scotland. So if you just hold there a second. Um, right, I had to stop collecting things because my business card was getting too long. But I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm a fellow of the Institute of Quarry, have been for over 20 years. Um, and as, um, as mentioned, um, 
well known in the industry. Uh, I do a lot of inspections in Scotland at the minute as well, for tarmac mostly. Um, okay, Can, should I just see if I can yeah. do this? Right, um, let's see what happens here. Based in Hexham, working all over the country, did a lot with um, uh, what was Continental Converse, um, became Joy Global, um, Komatsu. became Komatsu, became Fairport Tunnelling, um, and that's where they are at the minute. Based in Sunderland, that's why we've got the link there. But with, with Fairport, we've worked in um, Paris Metro, uh, the London Underground, uh, High Speed 2, um, and in the Arctic Circle. Now, uh, this is probably not... I wrote the first inspection procedure. Wow. Oh. It's... Uh, I thought, I'm an amateur musician, and I always want to leave something behind, like a famous song or something, but I'm going to leave behind the first inspection, which is mostly used by uh, most industries. And, and how I got to that point was um, we were asked by RMC to put a price in for 35 inspections, and our price was way out. And we thought, well, what we're doing? And we were writing pages and pages of screed about structures when they were brand new. We said, well, why are we doing that? Why don't we just classify things we see? And we'll have five categories. Um, so, read that. And I've represented operate as, um, as an expert witness. You've seen that bit? So we, we've designed um, pool sites. I've just picked a couple out. It's across three uh, in Leeds. Uh, which had everything from coating plant to concrete plant to dry sand and mortar plant to rail distribution um, and cement distribution. Plywood Hill Quarry region, that's quite an old one actually. It's just the, the only picture I could find of that. And I've mentioned the downturn, and because of that, we got into renewables in a bigger way because that market was growing. And we do general work. Black Hillock. The largest substation in um, Europe, and we've seen some of these pictures already. That won the Robert Stevenson Award, and that's in the Arctic Circle. Um, and uh, when uh, for Joy Global at the time. So right onto the meat of it: the quarry inspections. Um, somebody, even somebody this week said to me, "What day is it? Tuesday? Last last Friday, they said to me." Oh, yes, but quarry inspections are not statutory undertaking sort of thing. Well, they are, <laughs> yeah, because they come under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, that act has many regulations. So you've got the Act of Parliament, and under that you've got regulations like the CDM regs, for example. Um, and there's over 100 pieces of legislation, um, not all under the Health and Safety at Work Act, but uh, under the old Factories Act. Um, and there's, you know, the quarrying regs are just one of those regulations. Um, so this is what applies to you guys for most of the time. And under that, um, Regulation 12, there's a requirement to assess, monitor, quarry faces, structures, report on the condition, so the quarry remains safe to operatives. Okay, so what you must do this, you must write a procedure. You must record the inspections. Um, had, a, had a site with RMC. I'm trying not to mention too many of these names, but this it doesn't matter for these things. But um, the the HSC walked in, can I see, said, can I see your last inspection? So they pulled it out and it was a primary crusher. They said, have you done the recommended work on, on the primary crusher? And they said, they haven't. He said, right, okay, the primary crusher is now quarantined, you can't use it. Uh, which meant the whole quarry stopped. It's the only time I've known this to happen. You guys might have come across this before as well. But I got a call at five o'clock that night. <laughs> Can I get there first thing for uh, the next day to help them? Um, get over this problem. We, we got a 
we got it solved pretty quickly and the quarry was opened again. But that's the power of the HSC, you can do this. Uh, these days, they tend to be, they're so overworked, you never see them anymore, really. Um, that it must be undertaken by a competent person. What do you think that means? Competent. Two things. Go on. Try. <laughs> Try and answer it. <laughs> Qualified. Qualified. Experience. And experience. That's the definition of competent. Okay, you've got to say qualified in what sense, and experience in what sense. Yeah. But um, but the judge will make that uh, ruling if there's a fatality on site. He'll say, was the, was the inspector competent? Yeah. And he'll decide if he's competent or not. You know? It must include all the buildings, plant and structures, which is the, the bit that we do. We don't do the quarry phases. Um, and this seminar is about the fixed plant, the buildings, fixed plant, and structures. So we're making a pretty fast <laughs> headway through this. I'm going to need a lot of questions at the end, I can see. So under the regulations, there's something called um, the uh, approved code of practice or the ACOP. It's not part of the regulations. It's guidance on how to satisfy the regulations. And this is what you'll see on every quarry manager's desk somewhere, um, this document. So the approved code of practice, second edition in 2013. And that helps you to um, understand how to apply the, the requirements of the, of the uh, regulations. So the aim is to ensure that all structures are being maintained in a safe and serviceable condition. I often have run-ins with the um, quarry operator, a safety man, who says, you shouldn't be commenting on safety. And I go, hang on, at every induction you say, if I see something unsafe, I should comment on it. Um, he said, well, yes, but don't write it in the report. I said, well, I have to. Uh, because that's the whole purpose of these inspections, is to ensure that it's safe and serviceable. And, you know, if there's a handrail missing, or you're saying I shouldn't put it in the report, uh, and you can see the conflict here because he missed it, basically. Somebody missed it, but I will always put it in the report anyway, and then wait for them to complain. <laughs> um, certain structures may fail um, catastrophically, um, and these are high-risk structures. Now, it doesn't, doesn't talk about this in the regulations, but it's something that I introduced to Palmac and Breeden that they should consider special care with structures that might just fall down all of a sudden without any warning. So if you've got a beam, a beam coming across, and you overload it, it just deflects it more. But if you've got a bunker, that can collapse suddenly without warning, then um, should take extra care with that. So I'm trying to identify what I would call a high risk structures. And that's repeated in the uh, procedures that have been written down. So this is, this is what I came up with and um, how to categorize the defect. Now, as far as I'm aware, it's used, it's used by tarmac, it's used by green, it's used by um, our, RMC, I believe. Any others? You've seen something like this, the categories one to five, A to E, just to change it around a bit, you know. I have seen recently a report which has 12 categories. Ah, that blows my mind that. How can you have 12 categories of defect? Right? Um, and I've also seen one which said, I'm professor of such and such university, and this quarry is fine. And that's all it said. There's your inspection. I've looked at it. I certify this as fine. So there's no record of the actual inspection. So I doesn't, both of those are a bit useless, really. So dead easy. Category one, no defects. In other words, pretty much in new condition. Okay, dead easy. Take a picture, call it category one. Category two, there's a little bit of deterioration, which might get worse, but let's just record it. It's not a problem. There's no action associated with category two. Okay. I did a report on Friday. 
It was nearly all capital foods, which was great. For, for a, a plant, it's part of the plant actually, which was 25 years old, which is quite amazing. You had to do them in those days, I guess. Category three, there is defects um, and deterioration is happening. It needs some action to put it right, but it's not necessarily urgent. But you need to do something, otherwise it is going to get uh, uh, it's going to get worse. And may progress to category four, which is um, there's some a serious problem, uh, and you need to do some fairly urgent work. Um, it's not an immediate danger, but you need to get on with it as quickly as you can. Um, there might be other things like quarantining an area around it and that sort of thing. Category four is um, generally, how can I say, the worst normal category you can have because category five is way off the scale. That is immediate danger of collapse. Quarantine, but isolated, take it out of service. I can say that in 30 years of doing these, I've had less than a dozen category fives. And the way we manage that is it gets reported straight to the directors of the company uh, that it's a very serious problem which could collapse uh, at any moment. Um, you know, I try to manage things to keep the quarry working as best I can, but there's sometimes you cannot avoid it. You have to say, this is a serious danger of collapse. Um, so I did go to a site um, every now and then. Um, well, just a bit of history on who does these things. There tends to be about three companies. There was Clarks and forget the other two. Um, who covered the whole of the UK, basically. It was us, Clarks, and somebody else. I can't remember the name now. And, um, and then the location of the others as well. But procurement departments would put it out the tender. So, so we would tender it, and then they might appoint somebody else, and um, they'd pretty quickly come back to the people who've worked in having knowledge of these things. Uh, uh, and the come back to us anyway. So back to the three companies who are doing it. And one of the companies stopped operating. Anyway, um, on one of these instances, I had a new company come in to do it. And he did 17 category fives on one coating plant, which means the whole thing is about to collapse because they're using my procedure to describe it, immediate collapse, sense of collapse. Um, you can understand that the quarry operator wasn't very happy with that. Um, and um, that was the last one they did, actually. <laughs> Sometimes we've got to report that we haven't seen it. We take loads of photographs because we don't write everything down. The reports tend to be quite, uh, it's a first sight. I've recently declined a, 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 a tender for um, <laughs> inspections with one of the major operators um, because the, the uh, contract was so onerous and it included that you give us your best and lowest price for your highest quality um, and uh, we want you to inspect all the welds and bolts. Well, how can you do that for commercial price? So how this works is it's very much uh, a, a fresh pair of eyes just looking and you can be amazed what you can see that people when they're working on site are too close to it that they don't see everything. Um, and just a fresh pair of eyes just looking at something, somebody who's competent, experienced and qualified, who designs these things anyway, will can look at something and go, that's a problem. Yeah. Which, uh, unless you've done that, you don't know. But when so, you're not inspected items, yeah. how do you inspect them? Well, at some point in the lifetime of that piece of equipment, it's going to need to be inspected. Yeah, well, if you can't inspect it, usually because it's covered up. Um, so uh, we might need to come back and look at it again after it's been cleared off. Sometimes um, there's areas which are quarantined, can't go to many. 
and you've got to have special permission to say, we can't stop the plant. They will come back when you're in a, in a lockdown or something. Yeah. So how do we do this? I'll, I'll, there's a lot of, list of things here. But when I go on the site, first thing I look at is, is there anything missing? You look at it and you look, you say, where's that bracing gone? So you see that, it jumps out, you know? My wife really gets annoyed with me because she would walk around Tesco's like this, looking at the, and I, I was walking around looking at the roof. Huh? Like, it's the compression plant you thing. You see that bar? <laughs> anyway. She, um, I, you, you, you get a sixth sense. So the first thing you look for, is anything missing? Um, right, is anything being hit by something? Impact damage, really common, right? Can you see that? Then it's, is any corrosion? Um, and they're the, the first things you notice. And then some inspection procedures say, the site should be cleaned before you do the inspection. I'd argue, no, it shouldn't. Because the other thing you look for is you look down and you see things on the ground, these bull heads and things which have fallen off. And you go, well, where's that come from? And you see boulders which have rolled up conveyor belts. And you think, well, <laughs> if that had been cleared away, nobody would see it. So the whole point is not to hide anything. I mean, initially when we started doing this, Quarry operators thought we're trying to catch them out or something. No, I mean, I'd go to them and say, can you tell us what's not working very well here? Oh, and you've got a problem with it because I can mention it. And I can tell you that when it comes down to the production manager of that site, you'll have a pretty hard job to argue it against it if I say this needs to be done because if something goes wrong, his neck's on the line. Yeah. So I try and find out. I ask, well, what's not, what's not quite right on this site, you know? Um, so yeah, most people are quite helpful with that. So you've got abrasion, uh, conveyor belts cutting into things, just aggregate rubbing surfaces. You've got corrosion, of course, vehicle impact, missing members, modified structures, fractured wells and shear bolts. Well, you can see a fractured well sometimes. You can see missing shear bolts. You can just see them, yeah? But you can't see ones which are not obvious. They might be on the point of failure, but you cannot see it. You can't check the well, you know. So you do what you can. Build up material. I've seen roofs, I've seen whole buildings collapse actually with uh, material on the roof. Missing and damaged handrails and guards. This is where I fall out with uh, the safety. Is there any safety people? Ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you have the same problem with your inspections where the inspector goes, that, that's not safe? <laughs> not come across it, you do, you know. Okay, yeah, you're, you're a good company. Then. <laughs> what on you want? Oh, right. what oh, a lot of new plants are, are, can be unsafe as well. Um, unsafe access walkways and ladders. Um, that doesn't mean if they were designed in the 60s, they wouldn't comply with current access standards. It just means you might fall off them, um, you know, if, uh, if there's a risk. You can't go backwards in time to necessarily bring it up the current standards. Well, you can, but it's not, you don't have to. Falling material, uh, edge protection, of course. Now, I'm not talking about quarry edge protection, which is really important, um, but uh, I'm talking about vehicles, going in, driving in the primary dumpers and that, that, that sort of thing. Um, cracked concrete and masonry walls, tends not to be too much of a problem, really. Uh, integrity of oil storage burns, you go, well, why is that an issue? You know, well, I suppose damage to the environment, but uh, um, which would carry a criminal charge as well for pollution. Um, vibration, movement and vibration. This uh, this can cause um, problems with crack wells and bolts coming loose. So some very, very simple um, basic structural principles. This is a hangover from um, a tarmac, for example, and breeding have what they call level one, level two, level three report. 
just a bit of background on what they are. The whole thing is inspect the procedures, right? Do you have this as well? One, two, and three, or no? No, right. So okay. What 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 happened was when when we I pointed out to Tarmac uh, Tilcon at the time that you should be doing this. We're doing it with Hanson, we're doing it with RMC. Why is Tilcon not doing this? And so they did adopt it, right? And later with Tarmac. Right? Um but they were a bit late to the party, but they said, well, we can't afford a chartered engineer to come on our site and look at these things. We'll train up somebody internally. Fine, or the competent and experienced. It's not for me to say. Right, so they said, right, what we'll do, and they're still doing this now, we'll have a level one report where the quarry manager walks around the site um, once a year and checks that all the things that were recommended were actually done in by the previous report to this one. Right, once a year. I'd say it should be once a week. There you go. Um, level two is what we would do, what Malcolm would be familiar with. It's called a level two report, which is done by a competent person who's not necessarily a chartered engineer. Okay, they've made a definition there. So they, they uh, use uh, trained up fitters or whatever. Because they're cheaper than chartered engineers. And if he spots something, calls for level three, which is a chartered engineer has to do that. Okay. So somewhat systems do that. The way we do we we do these level two reports, um tarmac and uh, to an extent breeding um do the level two as the, the inspection and, and level three would be. It needs for an investigation, so that's that's fine. Um, but um, we always send a chartered engineer in because if we're doing work and we get it wrong, somebody dies, you can corporate manslaughter, and all these sorts of things. At least we can stand up in court and say, "Well, we've got thirty years of experience and we're qualified." We did everything which was reasonable under the, under the circumstances. And that's how we would be judged. Um, so we don't send out somebody who is not qualified, basically. And qualified to what level? You know, that's, that's subjective. But we'd say chartered engineers suitably qualified. But uh, some people, by the time I started down, they don't do that anymore because they use us mostly to do their inspections anyway. Right, just to understand a little bit of basic. So this was, we did some level one training uh, for Tarmac. And uh, this was to explain the three types of static forces you can have, just for terminology. So when they read reading our report, they go, you know, what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about axial force, first of all, in tension or in compression. If we've got any luck. Oh, yes, it does it. So the force in line. Hey, that's a tension failure. It does work. Buckling though, the, the force you can take in a member in buckling is much, much less than you can take in tension. Same member, maybe, because it's slender, it can just buckle out of plane. Like that. So it, it could be the tension force is very high, but if this member is long enough, the, book, the compression force it, that it can accept is zero. So when I see a, 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 a gantry and the bottom is being hit by something and I look at it and go, it's bent, but it's in tension, it's not going to fail unless the welds are there. But if I see a compression member that's bent, like the trestle leg, I go, that may fail. So then, so we've got, we've got compression or tension. That's one force. Bending is the other one. And you can get flexural failure by bending too much or bending and then failing altogether. And you've got shear. So this is how shear fails. Like that. Took us ages to do that. <laughs> right. 
So how do you get, what's a typical failure thing? Um, bunkers are the worst because they, the number of bunkers I've investigated, which has fallen over. So here yeah, we've got a horizontal force. It's a very big load on it. But the wind force coming on here acts in these cross bracings. Now, why have two? Well, one of them will be in tension and carries all the load. And one of them will be in compression, just bends out. So you always have two. Not unless that, comp that member, that one member, is strong enough to take both tension and compression at the same, not at the same time, but alternately. So it tends to be a, a tube or a bigger section altogether, where these are probably just 80 by 80 angles. And the act in tension only. There we go, wind. Right, higher structures, silos. Um, the bottom cone can fall out of a silo, usually because the weld at this point gets uh, abraded, it it's, uh, uh, gets worn away, the weld does, and the leg comes up the outside and connects to the cylinder, not to the, not to the cone. This makes this a high risk um, uh, structure. So that's what can happen. I'll just give you a little, I'm not naming the name of the company, but you probably know who it is. Um, there was a case where um, the operator was bringing back a bunker with it formed two cones underneath it, two feeders. And they were building a new um, gate and uh, conveyor underneath uh, the bunker. Um, it's rectangular, this one, uh, to uh, take material off for processing. And they went for their lunch and they got fish and chips and they came back and uh, the whole thing was on the deck when they came back. It was reported to the HSC. Uh, the directors and the engineer who was responsible for bringing the bunker back into use, who had been out of use for five or ten years or so, were all cautioned under the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, which was obviously... From that point onwards, by the way, that operating company ch completely changed the attitude to health and safety. Before then, it was a bit... Mm, I'm not mention who it is. Um, but it completely changed, I can tell you. Anyway, I got involved, I don't know, there's some photographs later, where they asked me to go and investigate. And I went to Sheffield to the HSC laboratories where they had samples getting ready for a prosecution. Um, the people didn't die, but it was a close in the MS. And they were going to get prosecuted under the Health and Safety and Work Act. And... Um, I looked at the samples, took measurements, looked at the bolts, built the whole thing in a model and load tested it. And I came to the conclusion that it was on the point of collapse since it was brand new. And the engineer or the operating company could not have foreseen that this would collapse. It was a defect in the design of the bunker. And they dropped the charges. You were pretty happy at that, I can tell you. Um, right, some more little diagrams. Um, stability. Okay, watch this. What somebody jump up and tell me what the difference is between these two models. Are you saying you can't tell the difference? This is this is my my uh, two year old granddaughter does this all the time with little blocks and things, and she works out what's up, what's going wrong here. Okay, I I could say it's it's a little bit modest. No, it's the same slope. Both the, well, it might be or a different shape thing. The difference in here, this is stable because the center of gravity of that is within the base of the subject there, where this one. It's outside the footprint of the structure. Just dead basic um, principles that nothing to do with 
the size or the slope or anything. It's where the center of gravity is it outside. And normally when an engineer is designing something, you always try and put the center of gravity in the middle third of the width of whatever you're dealing with. But not always. Wind turbines, for example, the center of gravity, it, it, it's on its toes. And there you're trying to make sure it doesn't lift off behind and cause fatigue problems. Right, so the other one is sliding. This is retaining walls and the things, uh, things like that. We'll slide. We've got one at the minute where we've got a dock and have built these Lego block things. Filled behind and the whole thing wants to slide across. It fell over first, but changed it, changed the layout, filled it up again. It's right on the verge of sliding. It hasn't slid. Right, and then finally, dynamic forces. So we dealt with tension, compression, that's axial, bending and shear. They're the three main forces. Vibration, okay. Um, is repeated loading, cyclical usually, either due to uh, a screen or a vibrator to improve the flow of material on whatever, um, or it's dynamic. So you've got an impact as a primary dumper drops a hundred ton of stone in a bunker. It causes massive damage. Um, so if you've got cyclical loads, then there will be a natural frequency of the plant and then various modes after that. So think of it like a guitar strings. If you if um, if you put a guitar in a room, it will just the strings will start responding to the noise around it, for example. Uh, and you can get excessive deflection in those cases as it grows, because it, in natural frequency, it, it, it keeps growing and growing and growing as long as the force is there to make it vibrate. And that can lead to fatigue loading. Now, you must have seen this on, on uh, where you've got a, a, a hopper with a vibrator to improve the flow. You're starting to get cracks and welds all around that. They keep welding them up, whatever. And that's what happens because um, that's what happens due to the site with the load to get fatigue damage. So that's, uh, I think that's, we've just been through these, but we've got some photographs now. Oh, I'm doing quite well on time, actually. Right, some collapses. Uh, this one, the river flooded, lift the bridge off its bearings and moved it downstream a bit. Had to go back and pick it up and put it back uh, where it should have been. Things like this are a bit scary sometimes, you know. <laughs> That's just sitting there. Uh, that would be a category four. It hasn't fallen over yet and it's pretty well contained. But what would happen if it did fall? Would it hit on here and slide down here or fall into the, you know? So I'm going to go through a series of slides fairly quickly. This is my pet hate, as Malcolm knows. There's precast L shaped units. Uh, with uh, ramps on cooled uh, feed ramps into hoppers. They always fail because they get hit at the top. You can do things to improve it by putting straps in and things. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can't beat reinforced concrete. Uh, this one is an um, asphalt plant, the um, hot uh, asphalt uh, hopper has slid off because the rails have moved apart. So you'd always look for members that come across the top, like U-shaped members, which just restrain the hopper so the rails don't move. And then look at the wear on the sides of the rail as well to see if it's running right on the edge or not. Come across a few of them. He here, this one, here's your, your center of gravity here. Here's your base here. That's right in the point of fall nowhere. And you don't need to, any structural engineering to tell you that. That could fall over. This, you know, okay, you might have your hard hat on your boots, you might be all right, you know, but uh, this this is an interesting one. This is T's, T's dock. And um, we, we couldn't work out what had gone wrong here. Um, and it turned out the ship had broken loose from its moorings and, and the, with, the wind blew it across the whole, across the River Tees, hit the whole structure, which is on piles, and this is the facing to it, deflected it backwards, it rebounded, and when it rebounded, it broke all the ties that hold the sheet piles in. The ship did off, 
Nobody found out who did it. It's <laughs> because it was an unoccupied site. Nobody know, noticed that it had uh, been damaged at the time. Oh, oh it's okay. That's all right. Oh, I hate these A frames. They, they do fall over um, unless they're absolutely securely bolted down. So we had uh, a collapse in. I'm not saying where, but the operator doesn't use these at all now. I think we're getting close, aren't we? So I'm going to speed up. Right, this is a um, uh, a filter press filter in a coating plant. Here we got unstable conditions under these legs, and the and the beam deflected sideways and, and collapsed without warning. Uh, was in that state. So we blew it up and it became in that state, which was a lot more manageable. Um, the interesting one here, the uh, lorry's come through with its, its tipper back up and lifted the conveyor off the trestle and put it down on the deck. This is the health and safety one in Sheffield where I went and measured all the pieces. This is an interesting one. This is a sound um, elevator into the Liebherr coating plant. The staircase is um, welded to the sides of the uh, elevator. Um, the, the quarry manager walked out at this level onto this platform and dropped six inches. He's made pull them back into the room before just a reaction. Pull them back in. Scary as anything. Right? The weld had broken here. But the really scary bit is this is the platform that dropped. And I don't know if you can see here, but there's a bolt there sticking out, 10 mil bolt. It's the only thing that stopped the whole thing falling to the ground. Um, it's very lucky, otherwise you just would have gone down with it and almost certainly been a fatality. This is next to the uh, tarmac I mentioned. This bought this off uh, British Coal. Thought they could use it. It's a rail loading hopper uh, structure for loading rail. And uh, we had to take it down. So we did. Um, we loosened the bolts on this side. The uh, burned through the columns on the other side, attached the rope to the columns and pulled it and the whole thing just rolled over. And this is the main line just here. So that was quite exciting. All uh, right, I'm just going to flick through these because the time's running on. Um, this is corrosion. You can see some of these are pretty horrific. You know, that's not a tension number. If you see this, those bolts are actually intact. But if you see it where there's a bolt there and it's wide, it's the bolt has failed. 100 tonnes on this jetty. When the tide goes out, you can see the piles are non-existent. Uh, that's now condemned. Um, and our operation. Lots of um, corrosion here. I'll just flip through walkways. Um, all these members. Look at that one. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to be walking on that, would you really? I'm not so worried about these ones where there's a hole in a hopper like this because it just means you lose material. That member there is not continuous through on that walkway. That could collapse at any time. Um, this is really dangerous. When you get corrosion in beams, it's always the bottom of the web that goes. Um, that's a cat five, and that's a cat five. Uh, this is corrosion of the reinforcement. It's your crumbly concrete, except it's not. It's just rust of the reinforcement. Um, holes in the steel. This is a. This was just. Two weeks ago, this one, you think that looks all right. And then I happened to go up the walkway and I turned back and looked at this and thought, something here, this bolt is pulling upwards. And it turned out that when the, the dumper was coming in, it would hit this plate, the whole bunker would lift up. It would pull these bolts. There was no bolts along this edge here at all. And then it would drop down, shearing these bolts and and uh, distorting the whole thing. So that, that was potentially Cat 5. We told them to isolate it and um, take, take the hopper off, basically. Tension, 
not a problem. More corrosion. Uh, impact damage. Hmm. Impact damage looks horrible. It's probably all right. Compression member, not so all right. How this works at all, I don't know. It's been hit so many times. Surprising that the whole thing hasn't come down. Uh, impact damage deliberately to move, get the stuff moving. That guy lost his job, by the way. Um, and there was potential for this whole bunker to come down. Bracings, which are not continuous, um, as you see here. Uh, bracings cut out, <laughs> so it's gone. Um, can't see what that one is. Modified structures, probably all right, but um, lots of rusty bolts and welds. And I'm just looking for it. There's a nice one coming up, and then I'll stop. Um, that's a bolt. That's how it can deteriorate, and you can't even see it. The bolt head is still stuck there. Loads of missing bolts. Oh, that's scary. There's a health and safety man. How could you walk past that every day and not see it? Yeah. Um, impact damage. Bit of a rusty uh, rotten timber walkway there. Oh, that one. You, you, you bang your head, you can't get past it. Oh, look at this. Now, this one is all of these members here corroded and not supported. It's a fall through potential. And oh, missing, missing walkway. Somebody fell through something like that not so long ago. And they were working on it. They lifted it up themselves and then fell through it. And I think that walkway, you, you can see it's overloaded. Uh, falling material. That one, all these cobbles, you see the size of them, from running down the conveyor belt and then drop off. Um, no protection to the end of this. So the machine gets his gears wrong and he's into the hopper. That's, this is the scariest thing I've seen, not this particular one, um, but a long time ago where the whole structure was looking like it was going to fall into the primary crusher. Um, these are the, the silos that need special attention. And there, we can see that one does have support on the cone, unlike the others. This one is classified by time, tarmac as high risk, and I say it's not, because you can see all the structure on this one. Um, you can see there, there's a complete separation in that. Oil bones. Okay, I'm not get too worried about them. Vibration failures. That is completely sheared there. That beam, and it's in the primary. Um, and then build up of materials. Um, oh, sorry, that's the last slide. I thought that build up materials quite useful for the wildlife. So, any questions? Um, I'm conscious that I've probably overrun five minutes. Okay, no problem. So, all right. Yeah. At what age do you start carrying out protections on structures? A1. A1. Yeah. And that's what frequency should you have a structure? Well, this is, again, right, I invented the one, two, three, four, five, which has been adopted. I also thought, how often should we do this? And I just thought, five years is too long. One year is too frequent. Two years is still probably too frequent. And so I said three years. Now, everybody's adopted, the whole industry has adopted three years. And that was just my idea, because I basically I was the first pe person, our first people doing this sort of thing. So I said three years. Now people think it's an absolute desperate requirement that, it, that they'll get told off if it's not done on the, the exact three year date. And I go, no, chill out, you know? So, <laughs> sometimes I might say one year if it's really bad. And I want to have a closer look at it. But they say, well, that's what the level one's for. No, it's not really, you know. I've seen things which have got past two level two inspections. Um, there's one in Scotland here. I don't know if anybody remembers me from that, where it was the same as the filter, bag filter that collapsed um, in Yorkshire, that one. 
And I looked at it and I stood looking at it for half an hour before, before I could work out what was going wrong here. And uh, it passed two inspections, okay, and I came to the conclusion it was a category five and I had to isolate it till they could do a simple repair and then it was fine. Uh, but there was a lot of people say, well, it's, it's past two inspections. Yeah, well, who did them? Why didn't they see it? I can show you what's wrong. Right? And, um, and they said, but standing, it's been standing there for 20 years. Yeah, but it might not stand there tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so you, 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 um, you've got to make a judgment on these things. There he is. Any more? That's the EMP back category five. Yeah. That, that would come under radar, wouldn't it? Mm. It's not near this. It's just something where you see it and you go, I don't like this. This, this We've got to do something. And it's not a, quite a near miss, yes. It could be past this riddle. That's not for me to decide. Choreography I should do that. But yes, it could, could be called a near miss because it hasn't happened yet, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to say, by the way, the, the guys who went for their fish and chips and came back and it was on the ground, that quarry, every Thursday until COVID, the whole quarry gets fish and chips every Thursday of lunchtime. It's a, it's a safety thing going, remember when this nearly happened? I don't know who pays for it, but they all, the whole quarry gets fish and chips for their lunch on that day. Do you know which quarry it is? I'm not saying. <laughs> um, any more? Come on, health and safety guys must have a question. Do you do you have level what well, do you have structural inspections on your worries? What? Just look, yeah, no, but uh, somebody does it. They're not everybody does it. There's, I mean, I don't mind mentioning this, but the forest sites um, were not routinely done when they merged with Tharma, but they are now. And I can say in 30 years of doing this, the whole safety on quarries has improved massively. Uh, from what it was, you know, I'd get in the early days, I'd get, I'd say, this needs some major work on it, and I go, oh, we're going to close the site in six months. Can you give us six months cover on it? Like it's an insurance policy sort of thing, and and I go, well, not really, but if you do, if you do this work to it, and I'll come back in six months and see how it's doing, then yes, but then they go, oh, well, we've got another two years out of it now. No, no, no. <laughs> that doesn't work. I think there was a series of accidents when the structural accidents kind of kick started the whole uh, structural inspections, if you remember. When it Which back. operator? Or any, all of them? Most of them. Yeah, I think everybody that's got a lot more health and safety conscious. I've got some horrible stories. Um, I've got another slide, but I'm not going to go through it. About other areas of scary things that I've been involved with. Um, but I've been involved in expert witness cases on flooding, um, which we won. Um, the, I, I'll very, very quickly tell you this, that um, Tarmac, it's, it's in the county court and everything, did a quarry, dug down, built it back up again. It was two metres higher than it should have been. Um, guy built a house for a million pounds in a hole next to the quarry. He um, got flooded as he was building it. He got flooded as he was just completing the build. Then he got flooded again after he occupied it, all within the space of two years. The insurance company paid up for the first two, and then they said, we're not doing that anymore. Somebody is to blame. So they blamed Tarmac. And I got involved. And... Uh, it was two weeks in Leeds County Court, a scary place to be when you're under when you're being questioned by Queen's Council and, and I think it's the most lonely place on the planet to be. I was I was questioned for a whole day, you know. And it, it, they're trying to trip you up all the time, you know. Anyway, one of the guys um who lived near the, the site went to the pub halfway through the court hearing and uh we were chatting about it, and this 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 other chap says, "Oh, my dad used to own that. He had a he had a cottage there, but it flooded all the time. Um, so we made it a cold stockyard, and we just used it as an office. But when I was a kid, 
I used to get a canoe and I used to paddle around the buildings, paddle, paddle it, and came in with a photograph and we showed it to the judge. And we said, look, that's before Tarmac did any work. It flooded then and we won the case. So that was one of the things I was going to add on the end. Right, I think uh, I've done an hour now. That's well over. <laughs> You can catch me separately if you want to. Um, anytime, or yeah, I'll give you a business card if you want. If you want to phone me up about anything. Well, Brian, just like to thank you, and a fascinating talk. Um, I think it's something that uh, is of interest to everybody. Um, I haven't seen any pictures where I've seen such structural defects before, uh, and I think people might go home and then have go to work tomorrow and have a look at what's happening around about them. And make the win opinion, so you may get some more work out of it. So, Fred, we'd just like to thank Brian in the usual manner, please.